ago, and, and here you are, and I'm thrilled to be here, and we um, got to see back in April when uh, Bible Baptist up in Grand Forks had their, their missions conference, we got a video of the building, and now I get to see you, the church. It's, it's fun to, and exciting to see a building, but it's more exciting to me to meet the people that inhabit that building, because we know the, the church is the people, no matter where they meet, uh, the church is, is the people, not, not the building. And so we're excited to be here. Um, I, I do want to first pray, and then, and then I want to take some time to set the stage for what you're going to see in the main service uh, regarding uh, the kingdom of Swaziland, and at the same time uh, teach you uh, a lesson um, from the Word of God uh, from Matthew 18 that basically is Matthew 18 in action. Now, let me, say, let me stop and say this. Seven years ago, I didn't set, about, set out to produce this, this story <laughs> that you're about to hear. Um, I just knew this. I wanted to be faithful to the Lord. I, I wanted to serve Him. I, I want to follow the Scriptures. I want to believe what God has said. And when God impresses you with something and step out by faith, and you live by faith. And, and me and a, and, a, and a group of people about this size, uh, maybe a few extras, um, now, about it, probably with including your children, about the size, our church in, in Fishville, New York. Um, we, we just followed the Lord in His leading uh, regarding prayer. And uh, God, God did something amazing um, on the other side of the world. And what I want to uh, look at this morning is regarding you being a house of prayer. Because God wants His churches to understand some key things about prayer. I mean, there's many dynamics from thinking that it, it's all about trusting God's character. It's about following the Lord. It's about faith. And it's also about His authority. And I believe that He has invested His authority in His New Testament churches. And if I can encourage you and, and, and challenge you at the same time this morning in that, that's, that's my desire. Uh, because there's so many things. I appreciate the verse up here in the back wall. Here's the, here's the end of where we're going to go this morning. We want Christ to be glorified. And, and, and He's going to be glorified through His New Testament church. And so we, we want to do that. Now I will say this. Um, I always wanted something for my, my children and the people of the church to look to and say, look what God did. And, you know, the, the children of Israel look back to the Red Sea crossing. Um, in the next generation, they look to crossing the Jordan River. Just, just things. And, and there are plenty of things throughout human history that God has done that that generation can look to and say, look what God did. And that was my, my heart's desire, but I didn't set out to, to produce this. But God gave us something that we could always point to and say, Look what God did, and it is so, it is so multifaceted. Um, I, I hope to cover most of the bases this morning, uh, but let's pray and we'll get going. Father, we thank you for who you are, the great God of creation. And Father, by your very power and strength, all things are. And you are in control of all things, principalities, powers, dominion, everything we know today is under your control that you either cause or allow all things. And so I pray this morning, O oh God, that your people would understand your great power and would be ready to, to stand upon that truth by faith as you lead them in your perfect plan and will for them, and not only as a church, but as they affect their community here in Bemidji and the surrounding lakes area of Minnesota, and even to go beyond them to affecting the world from right here. I pray you lead them in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, let's, let's start with Matthew 9. We, we're going to be in a few places. And, and before I forget, on a, we have a table outside there. Uh, please pick up a prayer card. And, and we, just, we just got these. You're the, you're the first church to get them. Just literally got them this past week. And so um, if you can grab one and pray for us, that's my, my chief desire for being here. And, and, I, and I truly mean that. Um, yes, a missionary needs money, but that's not my focus. Now, there would have been a time where that wouldn't have been... I may, I may have said that, but I'm thinking, no, I need money. I, I honestly, I don't care about money. I really don't. God, God has done amazing things in Fishkill. Um, there were times where we were praying and asking God to provide us thousands of dollars because we needed it. And God did it. And, and we've been through that a few times, and so we've learned to not even get focused on the money. 
it, it, God will take care of it. You get focused on Him. You know, seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. And so I'm not even here today. I don't, I don't care about money. All I care about is that God's people will support us in prayer. I'm very serious because that's what it's all about today. Why we're even going to Swaziland is because of prayer. And, and that's what I want you to catch a, a, a fervor for. Uh, you know, in James 5, 16, the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. And if you're like me, typical Christian can lack in fervency when it comes to prayer. Can, can, la- can, can lack in ineffectualness. And oftentimes we think of prayer as uh, something we just add add to what we're doing. Uh, but we'll find in the scriptures and we'll find in, 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 in true spiritual life that prayer needs to become the meat of what we do and not the seasoning. Which is what times we're often guilty of. We're just, just going to add a little prayer to our meat. But when prayer becomes the meat, then you see amazing things happen. Uh, but that, that, that's, that can be hard to arrive at because the flesh gets in the way. But uh, Matthew 9, but let's pray first, shall we? Father, would you meet with us now as we, as we just want to recall all that you've done and, and Father, look in the scriptures and see what you have established in them. My Father, I pray that you challenge your people today and I pray that you'd encourage them as well and Lord, just establish us in your, your great truth. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, in Matthew 9 and verse number uh, 27, we, we see a, a two blind men that come to the Lord and, and they want to be healed in verse 28 and when he was come into the house the blind men came to him and Jesus saith unto them believe you that I am able to do this they said unto him yea Lord then touched he their eyes saying according to your faith be it unto you and their eyes were opened and Jesus straightly charged him saying see that no man know it and this is, this is um, there's some complex things in here um, but the main thing I wanted you to grab from this passage before we go forward, it's, he's, Jesus says, according to your faith, be it unto you. I, I look at that as a blank check. Uh, I mean, what, what, if, what if a billionaire walked in here today and said, I have got all the money there is. And I know you've got needs. Um, write the check for what you need. What, what would you do? What would you write it for? What kind, of, what kind of faith do you have? Now, you might not even know much about this man, but he says that he has plenty of money. What would you do? And, and I, I see, as we go, I look at Matthew 18, when we go into the scriptures, we know that the Lord Jesus Christ has all power and authority in this world. And he says right there, according to your faith, be it unto you. So the, Lord, the Lord's giving us a blank check. According to his power, his ability, his authority, He's giving us this blank check. We can do with it now as he leads, right? We've got to compare Scripture with Scripture. If it's going to be to consume it upon our lust, God's not going to be in it. But if it's going to be something that's going to be for his glory, and it's according to his will, he says, here's the checkbook. If you believe, if you know, according to your faith, be it unto you. He, you know, the, these blind men there in Matthew 9. Does, does the Lord Jesus Christ have the power and authority to heal those men? Absolutely. But not every blind man was healed. And he said, according to your faith. He, he granted it to them because they believed in him. They came after him. They, they sought him. And they said, what can I do for you? We want to be healed. Okay, according to your faith. And I, and I think that we're, we, we, we're missing out. Now look at what it says here in Matthew 18. In verse number um, 15, 16, 17, dealing with church discipline. So in the context of the church... There in verse 17. Verse 18 says, Verily I say unto you, Whatsoever ye, there's that plural pronoun, I believe it's referring to the church, Whatsoever ye shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever ye shall loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Again I say unto you that if two of you shall agree on earth as touching anything that they shall ask, it shall be done for them of my Father which is in heaven, for where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. Again, a blank check. He says, he says, he says right here, whatever you bind on earth is bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth is loosed in heaven. Verse 19, I say to you, if two of you shall agree, it says, it shall be done of my Father of them which is in heaven. 
Now, before we get too excited about all of that and we get too emotional, let me give you a, a little, little poem on, on feelings and, and faith. It, it goes like this. Three men were walking on a wall, feeling, faith, and fact. When feeling took an awful fall and faith was taken back, so close was faith to feeling that he stumbled and fell too. But fact remained and pulled faith up. With faith came feeling too. I'm going to say that again because it's, it's a great... I, when I, I was preaching on faith and we had somebody visiting church, uh, I don't know, a number of years ago. And it was a pastor's wife. She came up to me afterwards and said, you know there's a poem about what you just taught us about? I, I had no idea this poem existed. I was just preaching the truths from the Bible. And, and I'm like, oh, really? And she told me, I said, oh, can you write that down? And we printed it. We put it on the back wall of the church because it's so true. Let me, let me say it again. You know, we live in a society that is so feelings-based. You know what I'm saying? We, 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 everything's based upon feelings. And, and when I feel... When I feel like trusting God, then I will. But sometimes I don't feel like trusting God. Sometimes I don't feel like I can have faith. So I'm not fe feeling, feeling, feeling. But that's not what it's about. Three men were walking on a wall. Ready? Feeling, faith, and fact. When feeling took an awful fall. You ever, ever have your feelings do a, do a nosedive and fall off, right? And faith was taken back. So when our, when our feelings kind of fall, then our, our, our faith, is, uh, what are we going to do, right? <clears throat> so close was faith to feeling that he stumbled and fell too, but fact remained and pulled faith up. With faith came feeling too. And so the principle, the principle is this, that if we'll base our lives and our hearts upon the facts of God's word, then we'll have faith in the facts. And at the end of all that, will the feelings come. So that's what I want to teach you this morning in places like Matthew 18. But before we go any further, let's go to Isaiah 56. Let's establish something way back in the Old Testament in Isaiah's day. Here, here are some facts. Then we're going to talk about faith, and then finally we'll talk about the feelings. And, and it, oftentimes we want to just get to the feelings. We want, to, we want to feel great because of what God did. Amen. I do too. But if we're going to ever feel great about what God did and give Him the glory and rejoice, even with the feelings of our heart, we've got to start with the facts. And so here are some facts. In Isaiah 56, in verse uh, number 7, it says, Even them will I bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and their sacrifices shall be accepted upon mine altar, for mine house shall be called an house of prayer for all people. So there's one thing that, that, that God is teaching us here, is that he wants his house to be a house of prayer. You know, one thing I think you should want for people to say of, of Northwoods Baptist is that it's a house of prayer. They pray, and God answers. You know, there's a lot of people that may not be interested in your doctrine, which is important. But the lost person may not be interested in doctrine. But if they know that a church is able to get a hold of God, then they'll want to know your doctrine too. They don't want to know the truth, and it's important to have truth. Don't get me wrong. But I think it's key that people know. We, um, just a few months ago, right before I left, uh, we, I re resigned the, the pastorate. I turned it over to another man at the end of March of this year, and we began full-time deputation uh, beginning of April. And um, someone contacted me. We had heard that someone's child was, was going through a very difficult time, uh, we have a big problem on the East Coast with Lyme disease and its derivatives. Uh, I think it's kind of hitting here too as well. Wherever you have people and deer, it doesn't do well. But um, <clears throat> their, their child was nigh to death, young, young baby. I don't even know how old, year, year and a half, two years old. And <clears throat> I, I, I messaged this man and I, I said, I'll be praying. And I know that the folks at Liberty Baptist will be praying. And his response was, that means a lot to me, knowing how much answered prayer that church gets. That's a testimony. Not even of me, of them, of the church. I'm going to put it all on, on them. Folks that are in service right now in Fishkill and praying and, and asking the Lord to, to do mighty things. And, and God does answer. And God has taken, miraculously taken care of this little girl, Bridget, in some amazing things. 
first they didn't know what was going on, they finally were able to figure out it's a, it's a Lyme, Lyme based issue and then they were able to deal with that accordingly. Uh, but God wants his church to be a house of prayer and, and not that you want to just go out there and broadcast, God answers our prayers. God will make it known. You know how many times in the, in, in the, in the scriptures the Lord healed somebody and he told someone, don't tell anybody. Doesn't that seem counterintuitive? He healed someone and he said, don't tell anybody about this. Well, part of the reason was crowd control because there were a lot of people that were just following after the Lord to, to, see, to see and experience a miracle. They weren't really completely interested in who Jesus is. And so part of that was crowd control, but God has a way of making his reputation known. God has a way of letting people know that he does answer prayer. And so let's talk about some more, more facts. Go into the New Testament, to the book of Luke. And here's a fulfillment. You can see it in Matthew and Mark as well. But we're going to look at Luke's account in Luke 19. God wants his house to be a house of prayer. He wants it to be known as a place where people pray and God meets with them and prayers are answered. Luke 19 in verse number 46, saying unto them, it is written, and here's the Lord referencing that passage we just read in Isaiah, My house is the house of prayer, but ye have made it a den of thieves. One thing we know, the Lord was very passionate uh, when he drove the money changers out, because there's something the Lord Jesus wants his Father's house to be known as, a place of prayer, a place where God's people communicate with God. Prayer is, is important. It's a dependence upon uh, the power and presence of the Lord. And we saw that there in Matthew 18. He says, where two or three are gathered together in his name, there he is in the midst of them. And so God's house, is a, it will be a house of prayer when, when God's people come together and the Lord's presence is there among them. Prayer is recognition of, of our weakness, our inability. We don't have the authority on our own. We don't have the ability on our own to take care of these things. That's why we pray. We pray to communicate with God. He loves us and, and we ought to love Him. And most importantly here, it's, it's, it's an opportunity to affect this world. Now go to Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 6. You talk about the armor of God and, and oftentimes when it comes to the armor of God, we, we, we quit at a certain point. We quit at the end of verse 15. But the verses that follow I think are even more important. In, in Ephesians chapter 6, in, in verse number 13, you know, take unto you the whole armor of God. And verse 14, to stand. And then he gives you all the armor in those verses. And verse 16, above all, taking the shield of faith. Verse 17, take the helmet of salvation. And we stop there. Verse 18 says, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit. And watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. And so here Paul teaching the church at Ephesus that you need to have all this armor so that you can stand praying always. We are, we are armored up to pray. What keeps us from praying? Oftentimes because there's a, a weak spot in our, in our, or we have a lacking a piece of armor and it gets us and it keeps us from praying and, and being victorious in this. One thing I've learned over the last 11 years of pastoring is that this is the key. I tried, <laughs> I tried so many things in New York to build a church, and nothing worked. Now, God built a church in spite of me. God put it together. But everything that we did in North Dakota doesn't work in New York. It's a non-religious people. They don't go to church. They're not interested in you. I understand what you believe. So how do you reach them? Well, we've found some ways, but the most effective way has been by praying. Just praying, seeking God's face, and that God will give you one who has an open heart. For some people, it was like pulling teeth just to show them one verse of Scripture. But when you finally got there, and their hearts begin to crack open in time, in time, one of the first converts there, it took me a year and a half, every Saturday, for about three hours, for a year and a half, before a guy got saved. And he wanted to all along, but he kept telling me all along, I'm a thick-headed Italian. All the best to you. <laughs> but this is how it started with this man. 
he lived in my neighborhood, and when I first met him, one of the first things he said to me, because when, when I told him, I told him I was a Christian. I didn't tell him I was a pastor. I, I told him I was a Christian. And he says, yeah, I, I don't really believe in God. I've seen too many things go wrong in this world. He said, but I, I sure hope someone can prove me wrong. I said, can I take you up on that offer? He said, yeah. And then we began to meet every Saturday. And he got saved, baptized, became part of the church. And, and um, I appreciate a man who's willing to open himself up. But that's, that's how it goes in some places in this, in this country. Hard-heartedness. Deceived by religion. Deceived by life circumstances. Hardened by society. But prayer becomes the key. Prayer is the answer. Go back to um, Matthew 18. And so prayer is the key. Here, here, here are some, some facts. We already read it there in Matthew 18, but I want to point out some things in particular about the facts of the house of prayer. God builds a church, and He wants His church to be a house of prayer. And one thing that God does is that He gives authority to His church there in Matthew 18, verse 18. He says, Whatsoever ye shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever ye shall loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. That's authority. God, God is giving His New Testament church authority to do what God needs them to do. You know, if I give you the keys to a building, you control who goes in, what goes out, what happens in there, right? You, you have authority. And God is giving His church authority to do His will. Now, if you've been given keys to a building, it doesn't mean you can do whatever you want with it. Doesn't mean it's there to, to serve your own purpose. Let's say it's a company, right? They give you the keys. It's giving you authority to do what you need to do to make that business go forward. It's not for personal gain. It's not for to do whatever. But you'd be given authority to do what the company wants and what the CEO and the president have to say uh, about that business. And the same is true of the church. You've been, you've been given authority to bind and loose, but according to what God wants to use that church to do. Then he makes another great principle here. He says in verse 19, Again I say unto you that if two of you shall agree on earth as touching anything that they shall ask, it shall be done for them of my Father which is in heaven. And here the Lord is, Jesus is teaching about unity. If two of you shall agree. You know, God wants his house of prayer to be unified. And I believe that a church needs to be in agreement. You know, first of all, in agreement with God. And can two walk together except they be agreed. And so God wants his church to be in agreement with him and in agreement amongst each other. Or I believe prayers will be hindered. And I base it upon 1 Peter 3, 7, where a husband and wife, remember over there it says that if, if he's not honoring her, his prayers are hindered. If a husband and wife aren't on the same page and, and things aren't well, his prayer life is hindered. And I, I, I think, I, I'll make this application, whether you believe this or not, uh, that's between you and as your pastor leads you, but I think that same principle could carry over to a New Testament church. That if a church is not in agreement, how effective will their prayers be? Just throw that out there for you. Because what did he say here? Again, uh, I say to you that if two of you shall agree on earth. Now, that's obviously in this context over, over the issue. But I go back to Acts. We don't have the time to establish it. But you go study Acts chapters 1, 2, chapter 3. You, you will see in those chapters that that first church in Jerusalem, one thing was true. They were in agreement. They were in one accord. How many times do we see that verbiage? They were in, they were in one accord. They were in agreement. In, in, and it was a huge church, too. Yet they were in agreement. And because of that, they, they prayed and, and, and the whole place was shaken. And I think it's key that a church is in agreement. You know, go to Acts 12. Here's an example. And I've taught this passage in Fishco so many times because it's so true. I, I, believe, I believe there is something special in corporate church prayer. Now, I'm not against individual prayer. God, God blesses mightily someone's prayers. But I think there's something special in the heart of God when His church 
comes together and engages in prayer. Acts 12, Peter was in prison. I want to jump down to verse 5. It says, But Peter therefore is kept in prison, but prayer was made without ceasing of the church unto God for him. The church, the church there knew what to do when Peter was in prison. They got together, they prayed. In verse 12, and when they had considered the thing, he came to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose surname was Mark, where many were gathered together praying. I'm not against people praying over the phone. I'm not against people praying on Skype, etc., etc. But there's something special when God's people physically gather together. That's what church is. It gathers together and prays. There's something unique. There's, there's something special, I believe, in the heart of God. Even in missions. Even in missions, prayer is key. Look back to Ephesians 6. And there's other places like Philemon, verse 22, and Romans 15, how that Paul is dependent upon churches praying for him and people praying for him. When Paul was, um, when Paul was writing here, we already read Ephesians 6, verse 18. It says in verse 19, And for me, that utterance may be given unto me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of, of the gospel. Paul, Paul was dependent upon God's people praying. Let me just read to you from Romans 15. Uh, it talks about there in, in verse number 30. It says, Now I beseech you, brethren, for the Lord Jesus Christ's sake and for the love of the Spirit, that ye strive together with me in your prayers to God for me. Paul is dependent upon people praying for him. And I am dependent upon you praying as well. I believe the Lord will use us to go forward and establish churches in the kingdom. And yet it's going to take God's people. Because I know it's going to be spiritual battle over there. Uh, Africa, Africa is much more open to the spiritual battle than America is. Asia is more open. And if you've been around missionaries from, that have been to those nations or have met people from those nations, the spiritual realm is very real. Even as American Christians, sometimes we say, no, I just don't believe in that. Well, if it's in the Bible, in Christ's day, he, he, he battled against the spiritual realm, did he not? Well, why doesn't it exist today? I think, I think the enemy has done a good job in causing American Christians to think that there is no spiritual realm. It's just physical. We talk about the spiritual, but we don't really believe in the spiritual to the degree that we ought to, because if we did, we'd be praying. And we'll realize that there's a, a real spiritual enemy. I, I have faced, and I don't have the time to tell some stories, but there have been a few key times in New York where I truly believe I'm face to face with a spiritual enemy. And, and it, 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 I'll be honest with you, it's scary, it's scary at times. It's like, whoa. Did, 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 I, did I just experience that? Did I just see that? Did I just hear that? Was that really that human speaking or somebody speaking through that human? And I know that in Africa, there'll be a lot more of that. It's a real spiritual realm. Jesus dealt with demons and people possessed with devils. And in other places in the world, that's very much more real than it is here in, in America. Think about this. One of the greatest methods of an enemy to be successful is to make people think they don't exist. Right? If, if, we, if we've been deceived into thinking that it doesn't exist, then the en that, you know, there's no enemy, then, then the enemy has free course. But if we see, you know, op open his eyes and he can see the spiritual realm, right? If we could see the spiritual realm, I, I, I think we would change the way we function. And so there's some facts. The facts exist that God would have his church to be engaged in the spiritual battle of prayer. Now here's where faith comes in. The faith in the house of prayer. Go back to Matthew 9. We started there. Let's go back there. The facts are that the Lord's church is to be a house of prayer. And the Lord Jesus Christ is very serious. We saw an example. He wants his church to be unified. He wants his church to be praying. Uh, your, your local ministry depend, is dependent upon prayer. Foreign missions is dependent upon 
prayer. Everything is. And God wants us to be living by faith. We know Hebrews 11, 6 and, and other places that God would have to do. But here, here back in Matthew 9, look at verse 27. And when Jesus departed thence, two blind men followed him, crying and saying, Thou son of David, have mercy on us. And so here are these blind men that we talked about at the beginning. They're following after the Lord. So when a, when a, church, when a church gets a hold of some facts, the facts that God's house is a house of prayer, the fact that God has given authority to His New Testament church. That if two or three will agree, it shall be done of our Father which is in heaven. So there are the facts, you know. And then he says in the next verse that, 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 where, that, where, that where you gather together, He'll be there in the midst. And so those are the facts. Now what do we do with those facts? Well, it's time to put our faith in the facts. Let's put our faith in um, Brother Kuzel, you know Brother Kuzel, of course. I don't know if you, if you know him, if he's been by here or not. But uh, he, he's a man that's been a missionary in South Africa for the last uh, 10, 11 years. And he's the man that led me to Christ 21 years ago. And so he and I have a great relationship. And one of the things that he taught me early on when we would begin to pray about things, he always challenged me, he said, Brother, get a verse of Scripture to pray about while we're praying. Anchor, anchor your faith to a fact from the Word of God. And I've used that many times in, in, in my Christian life. Say, okay, uh, the, here's a prayer request, here's a need. But what does God say about it? Let me, let, me, let, me, let me anchor my faith to some fact regarding this. You know, when it comes to praying for a soul to be saved, I'm sure you do that a lot. But over in 2 Peter 3, 9, it, it says that God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Therefore, I know it's the will of God for so-and-so to be saved. That's a fact. I know God wants them to be saved. I know that God loves them. And if it's, a, it's someone that you love dearly, I know that God loves that person more than I do. And God wants that person to be saved. And so I can go into my prayer and exercise faith knowing that God wants that person to be saved and loves them. And I, and I, and I, and I cling to that. I, I, I anchor my faith to what God says about that. Even things beyond that, when God, when God leads us, in certain things to be praying about, then we can anchor our faith to what he says. These men, they say, thou son of David. Now what's interesting is they call him the son of David. You know what that tells me? They know who Jesus is. He's not just a miracle performer. He's the very Messiah. He's the son of David. He is the anointed one that is coming. And so they've got the, they, they understand who he is. By the way, they're blind men. They didn't read the Old Testament scriptures to find out about Christ. Someone told them. If they're blind, they didn't read it. Somebody audibly spoke to them the words of life. Someone must have read them the scriptures. They know that this is the Messiah. And they pursue after him. And so when a church gets a hold of the facts of, of prayer, then they're going to pursue after Christ to put this faith in the facts. Verse 28 says, And when he was coming to the house, the blind men came to him. I mean, they're really, they're really pursuing after him. And Jesus saith unto them, Believe ye that I am able to do this. They said unto him, Yea, Lord. And so when we pursue after Christ, we ought to be believing in Christ. And finally we can receive from him, because in verse 29, Then touched ye their eyes, saying, According to your faith, be it unto you. It's all, it's all about faith. And the Lord gives us these facts, these truths, that we can anchor our faith to, and we pursue after Him, and we believe in Him, and then we can receive from Him what He has planned for us. With all of that said, in 2010, Brother Kuzel, who our church in Fishkill had supported, uh, and they still do, uh, beginning in 2006, he had a, a prayer request. And his request was to meet the king of Swaziland. And the Lord was immediately moving in my heart to say, get behind this, it's going to happen. No, God didn't speak to me audibly, but just in my heart, I, I, I know exactly where I was. I read that letter and I'm just like, I believe God's going to do this. I really do. And I brought it before the church. 
And they got behind it as well. And we began to pray. And for 18 months we prayed until it came to pass. And the rest of that story I'll tell you in a little while. But it was the, the culmination of these truths that we put to practice. We were a people that wanted to pray. We were a people that believed that God has all power and authority. We believe that He's given us power and authority to bind and loose and to come together and pray fully expecting that God's going to believe. We believe that God has given us that blank check to, to do the work of His kingdom. I mean, God, is, God has given us keys. He's given us a checkbook. You know, here's your great commission. You've got a job to do. You're supposed to reach the entire world with the gospel. Well, here are the keys to do so, and here's the checkbook so you can make whatever purchases you need to get my work done. The question becomes, what are we doing with that authority? What are we doing with that checkbook to get his work done? When we have the facts and then we put faith in those facts, then the feelings will follow. Now look at Ephesians. It is a, a joyful, joyful thing when God answers prayers. For 18 months we had prayed and it was on a Saturday in October of 2011. The men were working on the outside of the building. There's like four or five men out there and they're up on some scaffolding painting uh, the top part of the, of the building when I got the email from Brother Kuzel saying he has been granted a re the request to meet the king and it'll occur next month. And I... I, I I just couldn't believe it. I had stopped. I think I was painting with them, and I'd stopped to, to go check the, some things in the office. And, and, I, and I came back out. Guys, you've got to get in here. They're probably thinking they're in trouble, right? <laughs> Guys, you've got to come in here. And they came, they came in, and I read the letter. And let me tell you the rejoicing we had that day. What rejoicing? The feelings. The feelings. The joy. The excitement, the, the, the boasting in the Lord, the, the praising of the Lord from that day forward. And, and it just was just beginning, actually. <laughs> and you'll see why later, and the whole reason why I'm even here today. But look at verse 20 of Ephesians 3. It says, Now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that worketh in us. Okay? We can be praying, that's that asking. We can be praying, about, but God's able to go above and beyond. Why? Verse 21. Unto him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without end. Amen. The Lord Jesus Christ wants to receive glory through his church. And I believe one of the chief ways that's going to happen is when God's people take the facts of his word and put their faith in those facts and then God does exceeding abundantly above, then you're going to see a church that is just filled with joy and rejoicing in what God did. And then he'll be glorified in the church as well. And God wants this to happen throughout all ages. World without end. Amen. So the question becomes, not even so much for your pastor, but for you as the church, what do you want to see God do? A lot of times people say, oh, that's the, that's the pastor's responsibility. No? You know, I could have taken that request that we had with the church in Fishkill back in 2010, and I could have said, hey, I'm going to pray about this. But if the church didn't get behind that, it'd just be me praying. But it became something that we all just fed off of each other. We were in agreement, and it came to pass. 18 months later. And I don't think there was not one prayer service where someone didn't bring it up, pray for the king. And in the process, we begin to pray for the kingdom as well. And that began a love for a people that the church in Fishkill still carries to this day. Let's pray and we'll tell you more in just a little while. Father, we thank you so much for how great you are and how good you are.